One, two, three. Good. Thanks. morning good to see you this morning you're all sitting so quietly today that's great uh, <laughs> hopefully you're meditating on what God has to say to you and just preparing your hearts 
If you've been reading uh, the daily readings from the Gospel of Matthew, uh, you know that each Sunday I give you a psalm to read. And uh, do you know what today's psalm is? Not all at once, please. Uh, Today's psalm is Psalm 34, and I want to read the first uh, few verses from there. Um, It says, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This is a great psalm because it talks about God's goodness and faithfulness. And obviously this psalmist had requested God certain, of, of certain things to save him, and he was in, in dire need, and God did. And that's why he says in verse 5, those who look to him are radiant, their faces are never covered with shame. And so when you experience God's goodness, your face should show that. Sometimes we come to worship Sunday mornings as if we're coming to a funeral. This is not a funeral. This is a time of celebration a celebration of having experienced God's goodness in our lives. No matter what the difficulties are, we also know that uh, God has done so many great things for us. We enjoy his blessings on a daily basis if we only pay attention and and, uh, maybe write some things down, uh, journaling, and that will help us to realize what God has been doing in our lives. So let's come together to worship today, thinking about his blessings, what he has done, and to thank God for, for his goodness. Guzem haire no valgar talieres un chorot salmo senga se amen jamanak dere bi kovem anor kovuchun e mishtim perana spidella im ansis derach mo bi di barzi khonar nere bi di lesen yev urakhlan in ziet dere metsutsek u mekter partsratsenk anor anuna dere pandretsi u inzi badaskhan devav yev im amen yergur neres zis pergets Anor nayat san u luisarin yev anor yeres nere chamat san. Awotink. Let us pray. Our Father, we want to begin our worship service not only with your word that reminds us of who you are and what you've done, but also in prayer to invite you to come into our midst through your Holy Spirit. Father, we have come to worship you. So I pray that you would reveal yourself to us as we sing these truths, truths of praise and thanksgiving. We love you, Lord. Please receive our worship this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let us bow our heads in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, it is so good to be in your presence to lift up our voices and to sing praises because you are worthy of all worship. Thank you, Lord, that when we do worship you, we remember that you are God and we are your sheep, the sheep of your pasture, and that we need your guidance, we need your protection. We need you to protect us and we need you to feed us. We need you to strengthen us. And so, Lord, thank you for giving us this church where we can receive your guidance. We can receive the fellowship we need as we interact with one another. Thank you that we can meet with you here as a congregation and encourage each other as we sing our praises and listen to each other sing and to be reminded of the truth of who you are and what you've done for us. Father, forgive us for forgetting to come to you to thank you for all your goodness and your faithfulness and your blessings. Thank you that we enjoy so much every day. And as we come together on Sundays, we want to remember these things and give you thanks. And so, Lord, in this quietness of this place, we want to verbalize some of these things for which we are grateful and the quietness of our hearts. And as we give you thanks, Lord, we're also reminded of the fact that we have sinned because we're not perfect and we need to come to you to confess those sins and to ask you to forgive us from all unrighteousness. Thank you that you are a faithful God, that you listen, you hear our prayers, you see our hearts and you receive a contrite heart who comes to you in confession. So, Lord, we know that this past week we did certain things that we should not have done and did not do certain things that we should have done. And so, Lord, I bring these before you in confession and thank you for your forgiveness. And, Lord, in spite of the fact that you have blessed us with so many things, we, we are still in need of your grace for our daily needs. We have people who are hurting, who are ill, who are suffering, who have emotional, physical, mental, and even spiritual challenges. And so, Lord, we bring these before you, and I ask that you would touch each one of our hearts. If it's our body that needs your healing touch, I pray that you would touch us. If it's, if it's our emotions, if it's our mind, I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would invade our lives and would give us the peace that we need that passes all understanding. And may we go home today having met with you, having seen you, having encountered the great God of this universe and enjoy the peace that you give us for the rest of the week. We continue to pray for those who are ill, we pray for Christine Merjanian, who is um, receiving treatment. I pray, Lord, that she would sense your presence, that in the midst of all the suffering, that you would infuse hope and courage in her, that she would continue to keep her eyes on you. And we pray, Lord, that your healing hand would be on her to free her of the infections. We continue to pray for Matt and Lara. We pray that... Uh, your healing hand would be on them too to give them the strength and thank you Lord for the grace you've given them for them to be able to worship with us and so Lord we're still not out of the woods and so we pray for your guidance for your healing and I know Lord that there are others who are in need and so whatever the need is those who have come today before you Lord we bring them and we leave them on your altar knowing that you are aware and you hear our prayers and you're a compassionate God and you will do whatever is necessary. And Father, we continue to pray for Artsakh and all those who are hurting and suffering there. And 
Lord, we don't know why you delayed your response, but we pray that um, the Azeris would lift up the blockade, and I pray that the right kind of aid would reach those who are in need. And we continue to pray for all those who are suffering because of the earthquake in Turkey and in Syria. And we pray, Lord, that uh, you would strengthen those who have gone to rescue, to help, to aid. And I pray that the gospel would be clear through these people as the church rises up and helps those who are in need. I pray that you would be revealed and you would be glorified. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm glad to see you this morning. I want to uh, make a few announcements. So uh, next Sunday is our fourth Sunday of the month, and uh, we started a new worship service down in the South Bay in Cupertino, and so we will continue to do that this next Sunday. We meet at 2 o'clock. We have the same service there. Uh, we watch the first part on the screen uh, and then if I'm available and I will be there next Sunday, I will preach in person. Uh, it's a wonderful time for our people to come together in the South Bay. There are many who are not able to come here anymore. And so we are taking the church to them. And so let's pray that other people would get wind of this and would want to come in and worship with us. So that's next Sunday. And uh, we will also have communion next Sunday. We'll have communion for those who are here and we'll have communion for those uh, who are in the South Bay. So it would be good for us to prepare our hearts for that time of communion. Uh, we also continue with our weekly Bible studies. And so uh, just listen to, to follow whatever your group leader says. Some of them take a break here and there. And so we've got just a few weeks left of that as we continue in the studies in, in the Gospel of Matthew. So today is our installation Sunday. Uh, two weeks ago we had our members meeting and we uh, elected a few new members to our uh, council and and some will continue on council as well as our deacons board and so um, i want to invite all those who are on that list to come up all those who have served uh, on council and are continuing to serve or will start serving if you would all come and i'll read your names as well as all those who are on the deacon board, please. And so here, let me um, read the names. Um, our moderator is Ara Kulukian. Uh, our clerk is Caroline Schofield, who I don't think was going to be able to come today. Uh, our treasurer is Claude Khouri. Um, our council members are Margie Shamlian. And Jenny Ekmekji, Alec Gulaserian, Rosalie Kalopjian, Sherry Shagoyan Arroyo. And our board, uh, our deacons board are uh, Nanor Sadakian, Rafi Balabanian, Lara Khuri, and Carolyn Sagarian. If you would all come up, please. I also want to ask those who did serve. Um, if Lena, you would come up, and uh, Philip, if you would come up, and is Adi taking care of the baby? <laughs> Adi will have you uh, raise your hand from back there. All right. I'm grateful to God for these people. Uh, they work very hard, mostly behind the scenes. No one really knows what they're doing, but they call people, they pray for people, they come together for their meetings, they make important decisions for our church, and so I am grateful to you. The, there are some of you, like I said, Lena and Philip and Adi will be ending their term. They've served two terms, which is two years each, and then we have uh, Sherry uh, Arroyo as well as Jenny, who are starting a new term, and so... Two years each term, yes, so for four years. And so the new people who are starting, and then our deacons, uh, let's see, who's continuing and who's, well, the four of them are here, <laughs> Rafi, Lara, Nanor, and Carolyn, and so uh, they will continue. Uh, let me to read to you a few uh, scripture passages. In Matthew 20, 
we find a passage where the mother of James and John uh, goes to Jesus and makes a special request. Can you please make sure that my sons sit to your right and to your left? <laughs> she wants the best seats for her sons. And uh, Jesus has an interesting response to, uh, to her and basically says, whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. As the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And then we read in Romans chapter 12, it says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself or herself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. And since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us exercise them accordingly, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer. And finally, in Colossians 3, And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And I want to testify that those people who serve on our council and our deacons do these very things. They have different gifts and they use the different gifts in different ways to serve our people, that's you and me, and, um, and do it with hope and, and uh, with joy in their hearts. And so um, as we install them, there are a few questions that we need to ask the, uh, the deacons first and then to, to the council. And then there's a question for you as a congregation. And so to our uh, deacons, this is the question. Is it your testimony that you have accepted Jesus as your personal Savior and Lord? If it is, please say it is. And do you promise to strive to live in obedience to him and in accordance with the biblical requirements of deacons, as listed in 1 Timothy chapter 3, that you may honor Jesus by your life and live as an example to others? If so, please say, I do. And do you promise in the presence of this congregation to accept the responsibilities of the office of deacon in this church and to the best of your knowledge and ability to discharge all the duties of this office? If so, please say, I do. And questions to the council members. Is it your testimony that you have accepted Jesus as your personal Savior and Lord? If so, please say it is. And do you promise to strive to live in obedience to the teaching of Scripture, that you may honor Jesus with your life and set an example to our members? And do you promise to accept the responsibilities of a council member of this church and to the best of your knowledge and ability to discharge all the duties of this office, encouraging and exhorting the church to follow the head of the church, Jesus Christ, in the doing of his will? If so, please say, I do. Very good. Thank you. Um, I know that you guys do this. I've seen it, of how you're engaging and you're responsible. And uh, you exhort our people, and then you also lead by example. And I want to emphasize that even more so, that uh, we all have to keep in mind that we're not the board of some company, of corporation, but we are the church. And the leaders, leadership is dynamic, and we need to set an example for our people. So uh, whatever we want our people to do, our leaders should do first. And so I know that you will continue to pray for our people as I continue to pray for you. And so I have a question for you as uh, this church. Uh, let's see, where are we? Oops, wait, sorry. Do you, members of this congregation, acknowledge the candidates as deacons and church council members? Do you promise to encourage and pray for them in their office and to cooperate with them in the fulfillment of the mission of the church? If so, will you so indicate by standing? Someone's excited. <laughs> All right. Let us bow our heads in prayer. If you would uh, raise one hand, please, and uh, raise it forward as if you're laying hands on these people. 
And if I may ask Philip and Lena, you guys are on either end, if you would just put your hand on the person, on the shoulder of the person next to you and uh, pray for them. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful to you for your goodness and faithfulness and thank you that we can learn from you to be faithful to others and to the calling. I know that you have called each one of these people here to serve you in this capacity. Thank you for the special spiritual gifts you've given each one of them. And I thank you, Lord, for the heart that they have for you and for this church. I pray, Father, that you would fill each one of them with your Holy Spirit. And may they continue to seek you every day, to know your will, to allow you to renew their vision for this church in this area, in this community, and for our church to rise up and be a light in this dark place. And so, Lord, I pray that you would protect these leaders from the evil one. I know they will be tempted in many ways because they are serving you. And so I pray that they would continue to spend time with you each day to be renewed by your spirit. And I pray that they would be an example to our congregation and all around uh, the people all around us. And so, Lord, uh, we ask for your special blessing upon them at this time. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. May God bless you. You may take your seats. All right, I'm going to ask the uh, ushers if they would come forward so that we'll be able to give of our tithes and offerings as we continue to worship our, our Lord with this next song. Thank you very much, Ara and Tuchik, for leading us in worship. I want to dismiss our children. Those who are up through fifth grade can go out if they haven't yet done so. And uh, we'll dismiss the young people after the sermon. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, thank you for your mercies that we enjoy every day. Thank you that you are here when we open your word and you speak to us. And just as you spoke 2,000 years ago, Lord, your word is truth 
and it is relevant to us. It is both timely and timeless. And so we thank you, Lord, that in your wisdom you want to communicate these things to us. I pray for those who need comfort that you would comfort them. And I pray for those who need to be challenged that you would challenge them. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As you know, last Thursday was Vartanan's Day. Um, you probably know the story, but just in a nutshell, um, the Armenians who were led by General Vartan Mamigonian as their general were pressured by the Persians at the time to deny their faith in Jesus Christ and to become Zoroastrians, which basically meant to worship the god of fire and other gods. And so with a lot of pressure, the Armenians said, no, we will not give up our faith in Jesus Christ. In fact, we want to maintain our freedom in, in, to worship whatever we want to, and in this case, we want to worship Jesus Christ. And so there was the Battle of Avarai in 451 AD, and the Armenians were outnumbered by about five to one, and the Persians had a whole bunch of elephants as their tanks, and they crushed the Armenian army and killed General Vartan and the others uh, in that battle. The Armenians lost the battle, but won the war because eventually they were able to maintain their faith in Jesus Christ. Had they given in back then, Armenians would not have been Christians today. And so we thank God for people like General Vartan and all those who gave up their lives for the cause of Jesus Christ. One of their chief priests by the name of Yerishe Kahana has said the following, dying with a purpose is immortality. Dying without a purpose is true death. Dying with a purpose, in this case, the purpose is for our faith in Jesus Christ, is immortality. That means you will live forever because of your faith in Jesus Christ, because that's what Jesus has promised, that if we put our faith in him, we will live in eternity. And then he also says dying without a purpose is true death. In other words, there's nothing to live for and there's nothing to die for and that uh, there's nothing there for you. And so we understand that we've come to Matthew chapter 13 where um, Jesus shares seven parables with the people who are there, primarily the disciples and those who really want to hear what Jesus has to say. Um, in chapter 13, as we come to what is known as the hinge of the Gospel of Matthew, on which the whole Gospel turns, Jesus has been leading up to this point, pressing people to come to a decision, a commitment to whether they're going to follow him or not. And in chapter 13, he emphasizes the importance of the Gospel, its value, that it's worth everything you have, and its cost, that there's a cost to follow Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And so Jesus asked them, do you understand the value of the gospel? And are you willing to pay the cost, uh, whatever it may be, for the gospel? We keep in mind that Jesus is facing a crowd. In that crowd, there are people who are really hungry for the truth and they're listening intently to what Jesus has to say. But also at the same time in that crowd, there are people who are suspicious of what Jesus is teaching. And there are some who are hostile towards Jesus and they're looking for ways to trap him in order to kill him and, and get rid of him. Very much similar to any church where there are people who are really hungry for the word and there are people who are suspicious. And there are some people who are hostile towards what is being taught. But we see here in this case that Jesus is teaching through parables. And uh, the parables are basically uh, stories that test our spiritual sight and hearing. They also expose the condition of our hearts. So the way in which Jesus teaches exposes what we're thinking, exposes our hearts. 
And so through these seven parables, he wants to reinforce our need to decide for Jesus. Now, in the rest of the Gospels, we see that the parables are scattered throughout the Gospel, uh, where Jesus went to different places and he told this parable to this group and so on. But Matthew does it a little differently in that he puts these seven parables together in one chapter because of the way he's written his Gospel. And he, in doing so, he's trying to communicate something to us. And that raises three questions that, uh, uh, that are on our minds. The first question is, what is a parable in the first place? The second question is, why did Jesus teach in parables? And the third question is, why does Matthew group these seven parables together in one spot? As we said, uh, Matthew uh, 13 is the hinge on which the gospel turns. And so... Uh, Matthew 13 is the climax of the first half of the Gospel of Matthew. And so this is where uh, Jesus points to the fact that you have to make a decision uh, regarding the kingdom of heaven. Let me read to you uh, an example of a parable. And uh, you can follow um, in Matthew 13. And I'm going to look at the first parable, which is quite familiar to us. Listen carefully to what Jesus says. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Let me jump ahead to verse 18, where Jesus gives the explanation of this parable to his disciples. Verse 18, listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears a message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in, the hearts, in their hearts. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once received it with joy, but since they have no root... They last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding a hundred 60 or 30 times what was sown. So let's go back to our first question, and that is, what is a parable? The parable basically is an everyday story with a spiritual meaning. If there's one thing I want you to remember about what a parable is, it's this. It's a, a story from our everyday lives with a spiritual meaning. But I know that you're all good students of the Word of God and want to learn more, so here are a few more things about what a parable is. Usually, it has one central point. Um, also, it is the comparison of two subjects for the purpose of teaching. For example, the last parable of the seven is the parable of the fish that are caught in the net. There are some good fish and bad fish. And so Jesus tells the story in such a way that he compares the two so that he will be able to make his point. Another thing about a parable is that it proceeds from the known to the unknown. For example, they all know about yeast, but the way Jesus explains what the yeast of the kingdom of heaven is, it's different. And so uh, it starts with something familiar and then moves on to something that's new to them. It can be a riddle or an advanced comparison, such as the parable we just read. In other words, there are many comparisons in it, so we call it an, uh, a riddle or, or advanced comparison. There are different soils. And then um, we see that 
Jesus was a master storyteller, and that's why he told stories, because he held their attention. And then also we see that it enables people to see themselves in the story, and as they see themselves in the story, they want to ask themselves the, the question, which type of soil am I? As you listen to that story, you start thinking to yourself, am I the uh, soil that is shallow or am I the kind of soil that's rocky and nothing sticks or, or, or whatever? And so this is the way Jesus tells, tells his story and so that people will think about it. Oftentimes there is a twist to, uh, to, to the story so that makes people reflect on their own lives. And let's take a look at the um, parable of the, whoops, what happened? The parable of the uh, mustard seed and the yeast. Can we get back to the, they're working on it. All right. I'm going to read from uh, chapter 13, verses 31 through 33. Listen carefully. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, Yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch on its branches. So people know about the seed and about the, uh, the tree and, and the fact that birds come and settle on it. But what is the meaning of it? And so he will explain that later on. Verse 33, he told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into uh, about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Now, here's the interesting thing about, about yeast. Um, to the minds of the people, yeast or leaven is not a good thing. In other words, if you remember back uh, when the Israelites were supposed to leave Egypt, God had told them that there should not be any yeast in the house. They should remove it and throw it out and then they should eat their bread without yeast in it and then be ready to, to move out. And that was a symbol of, of evil, of sin in their lives. And so they needed to purify themselves before they did what God was calling them to do. People were very much aware of that. And now Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast. And it's put into, this, uh, into the flour and then it takes time for it to get through, th through the whole thing. And so they're wondering, if this is something bad, how is the kingdom of heaven like yeast? And so what Jesus is trying to tell them is that for these proper church or synagogue leaders, the scribes, the teachers of the law, what Jesus is telling them that God can take anyone and use them for his kingdom in any way he wants them to. So God is the one who transforms society through characters like the disciples who were simply fishermen or tax collectors or uh, people of everyday life. They weren't anything special like teachers of the law or Pharisees. And so God can take anyone such as these characters and he can um, uh, change the world through them as, as he did. And that's something that we see in, in our world also, in, in our society also, that God can take someone who we think is a nobody can do something great things through them. Let me give you a few examples. The first institution of the blind was started by a monk. The first free dispensary was started by a Christian merchant. The first hospital was founded by a Christian woman. Today, if you look deep into what's happening in China and Iran, and all we think about or we see or hear about is the unrest, but we know that the church, the underground church in these countries is growing so fast and so big that they're going to take over pretty soon. And the Iranian government has said, we try to stop the church from growing, and we've realized that we cannot, so all we're doing is trying to slow its progress, slow its growth. And so Jesus takes something very small, something very insignificant, and then you see it growing and growing. Uh, there's another story behind the uh, story of uh, Vartanans. And so it is said that after the Battle of Avaraj, uh, the Persians took some of the priests and their leaders as prisoners and took them to uh, Persia. And um, 
their chief priest of the Zoroastrians, who was there observing them, Notice that every time these guys got together to pray, there was a light shining on them. And he was curious about it. He realized that every time they prayed, this light shone on, it was shining on them. And so he asked them about it, and they shared the gospel with him. And he eventually, he was so curious and he was so mesmerized by this that he himself became a Christian. And his government killed him and his family so that the word would not spread around to others who also would become Christians. And so this is what we see Jesus telling us, teaching us way back 2,000 years ago that we saw the same thing happening in 451 AD during the, uh, the, the time of uh, Kachvartan and so on. And so one of the things that we have to reflect on is this. I'm sure that wherever you are today, you look around you and you say, I am such a minority, a part of a minority. Whether it's at your school. How many Christians do you know at your school or your college? Whether it's your workplace. How many Christians do you know at your workplace? Whether it's uh, your old friends, among your old friends. And so we think that we're such a minority that eventually it's going to die off. And yet what we see as we look at history is that Jesus started with how many disciples? 12. That became 70. That became 120. And eventually, the Roman Empire that tried to uh, eradicate Christianity by killing all the Christians, within 300 years, the Roman Empire took on Christianity as their official religion. And that's what Jesus was trying to teach his disciples back then, that you take that little bit of yeast... And in time, that's what the kingdom of heaven is like. It will continue to spread. It will continue to grow. And so the second question then that leads us to is, why did Jesus teach in parables? The first one was, what is a parable? Why did Jesus teach in parables? And as an example, I want to look at the uh, answer Jesus gave to his disciples when they asked him the same question. So let's take a look at this. Chapter 13, starting with verse 10. So after Jesus tells them the story of the sower, which is really the parable of the soils more than the sower, it says the disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have even what they will even what they will, sorry, <laughs> whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are you, but blessed are your eyes, because they see, and your ears, because they hear. For truly, I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear but did not hear it. There are three reasons why Jesus was speaking in parables. First one is, we see that as of chapter 13 of Matthew, Jesus spends less time with the religious leaders and more time with his disciples and the crowds who are ready and willing to listen. And so he's teaching them through stories that will convey the truth without alienating them. So whenever he was speaking to the Pharisees or teachers of the law, they would start arguing with him and try to ask him questions to trap him. And so Jesus realizes that they're rejecting him and eventually they're going to kill him. And so he's moving away from them and he's spending more time with those who want to hear the truth. The second reason is that through the parables, Jesus reveals truth to those to whom it was given. The truth to those 
that it was given. Listen to what he says. When the disciples asked him, why do you teach in parables? Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. In other words, there are those who are hungry for the truth and really want to know the truth. And in that case, God opens their hearts and their minds to see the truth and understand it. But for those who have rejected Jesus and are hostile towards him and are looking for ways to reject the gospel, they become even um, deeper in darkness. They come even in darkness. So, so it's the law of atrophy. This is what Jesus said. Whoever had will be given more and they will have an abundance. And then he said, whoever does not have whatever they have will be taken away from them. And that's life, isn't it? It may not be fair, but that's life. A simple example is our muscles. The more we use our muscles, the stronger they get, the more we can use them. The less you use your muscles, the more they atrophy and you can't use them anymore. So it's the same thing with the kingdom of heaven. And this is what Jesus is saying. Those who are eager to listen, to understand, who want to know the truth, they will be given the truth. God will open their minds to understand. And those who are not interested, uh, it, it, it will go deeper into darkness. And so he says the parables will bring light for those who look for it and hunger for it. And for those who do not, the darkness intensifies. And a good example is the last piece of uh, chapter 13 where Jesus is in his hometown in Nazareth and they ask, who is this kid? Was, isn't he the one we, we know uh, how he grew up? And so that's how they rejected him and, and that's why Jesus stopped doing any miracles there because they were rejecting him. Finally, we come to the third reason why Jesus spoke in parables and that is parables nudge a person towards a decision. A parable is like a mirror. As you look in the mirror, you see what's right and you see what needs to be fixed. And so the person listening to the story will begin to see himself in the story and will say, uh, uh, now I see where I'm falling short or what I need to do or where I can be encouraged. And finally, we come to the third part, and that is why does Matthew group them together? Why did Matthew bring all these seven parables and put them together? The answer is a very simple one for simplicity and for clarity. Um, as I said, Matthew 13 uh, is the climax of the first half of the book of, of uh, Matthew. And the question that Matthew is trying to put forward and Jesus is trying to put forward is, will people follow Jesus make a commitment to him, or will they reject him? And so as you look at all these parables together, there's one question that summarizes the whole thing. And that one question is, what will you do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus? Now, when you analyze each of the seven parables, you see that each one of them has this unique question as well. For example, the first parable is a parable of the soils, and the question that, that um, we're left with is, what is your response now? Which soil are you like? Will, do you want to be like the one with the thorns, or the one that's the rocky ground, or do you want to be like the good soil that produces um, more and more? The next parable is the parable of the weeds and the wheat. And so the question we're left with is, why does evil persist? Why is there evil in the world and what do we do about it? What can we do about it? The next parable is um, the mustard seed. Why does the kingdom seem so insignificant? He said it's the smallest seed and yet it becomes such a huge tree. And so why does it seem like uh, it is so insignificant? And then the parable of the yeast. Why is the kingdom so hidden? And we know that the yeast will spread eventually. And then the treasure and pearl, how do people find the kingdom? Because this is a treasure, this is a pearl that is of great, great value. And then finally, the last parable is, what will be your response then? And I will look at this in the Armenian sermon. And so, as we... Oh, at the end of the parables, Jesus asked this question. Have you understood these things? Have you understood these things? And in scripture, we see that understanding means to know, and to know means to do.
In other words, it's not enough just to say, oh yeah, I know these stories, but what are you doing about it? Are you committing your life to Jesus Christ, to following him and to be his disciple? And so the question is, are you doing them? Are you willing to make the necessary sacrifices to have the gospel, knowing that this will give meaning to your life and it'll give you an eternity of joy and satisfaction. As I was thinking about this, I started wondering, do we really know the value of the gospel? And are we counting the cost to follow Jesus? In the parable, Jesus talked about the man who sold everything he had in order to buy the land that had the treasure of the gospel. Or he sold everything he had because he knew that this one pearl was of greatest value. Do we treat Jesus as if he is the most important thing in our lives? Or do we look at Jesus and the gospel and the forgiveness of sins and eternal life and we say, that's good, but there are other things in my life that I think are just a little more important. For example, when we say I'm too busy to read the Bible, I'm saying Jesus is important, but not that important. These other things are more important for me. So I don't spend time with God on a daily basis. Once in a while, if I have some extra time, I'll do that. Same thing comes to Sunday morning worship. God has given us seven days, one of which belongs to him for us to come together to worship. But do I worship God when it's convenient, when I don't have any other work to do, or I'm not so tired, or I didn't stay up late the night before? Or do I make it my habit out of conviction that this is so important that I'm willing to set everything else aside to be here with God's people uh, to worship him? Same thing when we think of our children and our grandchildren. We want the best for them, the best schools, the best extracurricular activities, whether it's sports or music or whatever the case may be. Those are priorities. When it comes to church stuff or Bible studies or something, like that, that becomes a secondary thing. If they have time, they can do that. Otherwise, these other things are the most important. Th same thing with our own jobs. We strive for excellence in our jobs, and we should. But at what cost? In that, do we have the same passion for God and His Word? Do we strive for excellence in our knowledge of God's Word and its practices? Or those are good things, important things, but nah, these other things, my job, my kids, my activities are, are more important. So it's important for each one of us to look at our own lives. And as Jesus tells these stories, do I see myself in them? And do I answer the questions that Jesus is raising? And so I want to encourage you to go home today and read chapter 13 one more time for yourself. Read it and see yourself in the stories and answer the questions that Jesus asks. Because at the end, Jesus is going to make a decision about your life and what will be his response? Have I persevered to the end? Let us pray. Our Father, thank you that you've brought us together and you challenge us. Oh Lord, every time I read these, I wonder where I'm at. And so Lord, I pray that in your sometimes gentle ways and sometimes aggressive ways, you, you want to shake us up and make us think Lord, I thank you for our people who are here today because they love you, because they are hungry for your word, for the truth. And yet, Lord, sometimes I confess that you take second or even third place and other things become more important in our lives. And so as we read these parables, Lord, we understand the, the great value that it is, the gospel is. So help us to count the cost and be intentional about following you, about making you the most important
nothing in our lives. Thank you, Lord, that you're always patient with us. Thank you that you use these stories to nudge us forward to a decision. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to dismiss our youth, those who are um, the um, sixth grade and up, to go and uh, be with Matt for the discussion. And then we're not going to sing today. We're going to sing the high at the end. And so I'm going to pivot into the Armenian message real quick. And so if you don't understand Armenian, I want to encourage you to read the, first, the, the last parable uh, in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 13, um, where Jesus talks about the good fish and the bad fish. Bidigartam das nierort. Kulhun, Matthew Siavdaranim das nierot, Kulhun, Karasunioterot Hamarenes Keselovir Vercin Araga, Vor Guda ir Ashagert Nerun, Yevjovo Burtin. Tatsia Lerikinta Cavortuna, Zovet Sequats Urganim Menemane, Vor Amende Sakzuke Jove, Ir Urgana lets Vetsav, Tsamak Hanetsin, Unestan, Aegnera. Aman Nerumech Jovetsin, Yev Anshaha Turstseketsin. I spes be the lash Haris Vercher, Reshtak Nere be the Ellen, Wartar Nerun Mechen, Charer be the Ad Zaden, Yev be the Tseken Zanunk, Geragi Hnotsimech, Hon be the Lalal U Agraner Gurgadel. He says a sav, Irashaget Nerun. Haskatsak, Ais Amen Panere, Ashaget Nere Sin Anor Ayo Der, Aniga Savanunz Anor Hamar Amen Tabir, Vor Yergin Kitakavurchan Ashaget Diagadze, Namane Dan Der Martuma, Vor Ir Kansen, Nor Yevhin Paner Gahane. Isus Iriot Aragner Yefor Gabatme Gaskasi, Ait Aragov, Vor Gestibe. Madiga Norin, Vor Voroshum Arne te bidi and Tuni Hisuse, Yev Anor Hoske te bidi Merge. Yevasiga Shat Garevor Hartsum, Mane Poloris Hammer, Vor Menkal Madadzeng Abdul Masin te, Menk bidi and Tunink, Hisuse, Yev Anor Hoske, Yev Voshtemian bidi and Tunink, Haba bidi Hara de Venk, Canivor Verchin Araga. Gehartsenete Archok Astudzo Voroshum inch with the Lacuma sit. Yevurem and Mesg Merev or Bessimink Hara de Venkmer, Aroya Gyankin Mech for Asuzohet Kalenk, Yev Hanazantink Iren Amen Pani Mech Canivor, Verchin Aragin Mech Mesig Patsadrete, Ora Bidika, Verchin Ora, Yerp Aswaz Inca Bidizade, Parin Charen, Artara Charen. Jesus ir aragnerum ech mezig sorvetsene vor ais ashkhari vra yegegetsime chiga vor gadarela bes artarnerov letsune ev menk alki denk mer antsnagan portsarutenen vor yegegetsin mech kan anonk voronk iskagan havadatsialen vor aroria asuzoet kahantibin zink kesirin ev ghenazantin iren ev gan gelts chagerdial havadatsialner Voronk, voron samar gronk araroguchun mene gukan araroguchun gnen gertan pats havat chiga hanazan tuchun chiga asudzo hanteb. Yevadon amar Jesus ke patsade voromi aragin mech vor gadarial igegetsima bidi chilla pats verchavorchian ore bidi kayer asvaz tsuknorsima bes urgana bidi nede yev polor tsugere bidi havake yev bidi zade bidi pajne. Parin Charen. If Terevus Matius Avedaran Avedaranichi at Kukerera Siga ir Matkin Yedin Uner Hutan. Canivor Hutai Radze ir Toguma ir Hisusa Matnella Arachin Taru Yegeretsin Hamar Metz Hartzer. Inch Pesgerna Mega Atkan Jamanagan Snell Hisusi Hedia Vercher ir Gernaga Tartsnell Anoriev 
uranal zinc cam cam matnel zaniga. Ie va dorom ar boas ara cial gacare ara cingor intatis da serot cu chunmec ca se usti anvor ca se be te hasta dun geta ze to escusana vor celate ina. Vrem in mezi hamar al hartsum mane te vercin ore ier cu asvads mez polores ganche ira ceva. Așa că nu la mer badaschana, hava darim manații, că zi hamar te voci. Vrem în gădesnic vor aragneru, șarcă găscăsi, harțumov te marte bidien tuni, Iisus e vanor hoscă, e vercin aragă, că verciana te arteoc asvadz bidien tuni, marte te voci. Te bidi mergez în canivor, marte ai te sac voroșum aradze. Vrem în iar cu care vor cailer gan mezi hamar. Ara cine bete că vestă el am tunie vest. Vor derisuze întunat zinci premier pergiți ce host vanelov mer mehgera. Ie viegrot cailer mezi hamar. Hava dal hava darim manalne. Hara devel mer aroria gânkir mech mincev vercin ora. Cencer nar ges cadar așa gert nere la Hisusi. Se lo vor ies, e vor badani ei, tarci e gaba, și care ți-i susțin tuneții, atche e ver, uzați scârnam în el ca ni vor, chidem vor, ieri în pidiertam. Adică, havat ce? Ce încărnar mer uzați adena, e vor gahar mari în azantin, e vor ci har mari și ci în azantin. Uremen ir aragneră găver ce ați ne, Isus, ai harțumă, harținelo, hascățac, ai amen paneră. E așa că nu e regăbat de Ashanin, se lovă aioder, hascățanc. E vorem în Hisusi, bada Ashanin, Irenț Hedeviane, Sharnaget Sek Sorvila, e v Kordzatrele. Irenț că se anor hamar amen tăbir, vor ierghi tacavocean așa gher de gaze, nămane dander martumă, vor ir canțe nor e v hin paner gahane. E va surmeci. Terevas Matiosi ori nagaga, vor Hisusi Kale araj voroș paner sorvadzer. Pait Hisusi Kalen hedo al aveli pan sorvetsav. E vasigan nu in portsaruciun în aev unețan ir așagetneră. Matiosi așagetneră vor e gerețineru araj nortnerieran. E vas albetgela mer portsaruciună, e per havadatia ner vor. Mănc paner sorvat zi în Hisusi Masin, pați Hisusi Kalenes, Hedoșad aveli pan sorvet zi în Uremen Sharnagen, sorvile, Iev, Kordzatrele, vorbesi Haradeveng, mer hokevor Gyankin Mec. E manor hamar, Matiosi Avdararim, vercin masă, mer ocin, dar s-n ierot cu hun, vercin masă, Hisus găscușat să ne mez. Vor celanc nazovreți, nazareti, mer ocin, nazareti, ca la chi martoți pes, Urge Hisus e gadzer, e mergeng zing, chorelov vor meng aveli lavă chideng, haba îl lang matiosi e mis așa gheat nerumbes, vor sorva zing, pați badrasteng al aveli sorbelu, e corza trelu, vorbesi hara de veng mer, aru ia gheat închid meci. A o teng, e că n-a ori hașra galeng, vor mez găsire, s-a dor hamar de vadzez cu hoscăt. Ca o temă de vor mencal, hava darim el lang, hara de velu. Vorbesc vercin oră, mezi ce se vor mez ce se janchnar, haba mezi se pari o hava darim zara, medir cu horat ura hociuna. Isus Ianov. Amen. Igec polores vot gigan ankiev, har mere yer king. Let us all stand and sing the Lord's Prayer together.
Սիկոյար կայչուն եւ զորություն եւ Փարք Հավիդյանս Հավիդյանից եւ իմ ամերներ Հիսուս Քրիստոսի շնորհքը, ասուծոսերը եւ սուր փոքվին հարթակչունը Սեր ամերն հետլա հիմա ու Հավիդյան The Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be merciful to you the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit Amen <laughs>